Uh, there were a couple of, of areas that have been discussed a little bit, uh, which I wanted to elaborate on because I think uh, I think it's significant. Um, one of them relates to uh, intact aborts, uh, the question of a crew escape system, and whether that should be automated, whether the crew should have control, and what, what is required if you have, actually have the, the crew take control. I think um, Chris Kraft gave a, an interesting perspective uh, with the idea that uh, rather be, because of the difficulties or given the requirements, really the impossibility of incorporating a, uh, a capsule escape system for the shuttle, uh, the project basically took the point of view that the shuttle itself was the escape pod, which means that you have to recover the shuttle intact regardless of any engine failures. Now that, of course, requires 100% reliability of the solid rocket boosters, which we never did achieve uh, with Challenger. Although, of course, had we operated it within its spec limits, it might be another story. But in any case, um, I want to go through some of the details of uh, a return to launch site abort. Um, and then I'll describe uh, an incident which occurred on, on our last flight to give you a, an idea of, of you know, what's involved in the actual operation of abort modes. So the idea is, uh, you know, you have the two, the two solid rocket boosters which have to light, okay, and they're going to perform no matter what. If, if one of those boosters doesn't light and the other does, <laughs> it's a bad day, what can you say? And obviously if one of them fails during flight, uh, it's a bad day. And, which was more of a design problem, if they don't tail off at just the, the identical rate uh, so that you get uh, asymmetric thrust greater than a certain capability of, of the shuttle to control, you've had a bad day. And, and because of the requirement to have uh, symmetric thrust, um, I, I don't think this was discussed before, when, when the solid rocket boosters are poured, you know, they mix a batch of, of uh, propellant, sort of like, you know, you mix bread dough. Um, and then they pour the propellant into both the left and the right booster segments at the same time. So each booster segment has the identical batch of propellant in it. It may not be the same from the bottom to the top, but it's the same from the left to the right. And that's critical to make sure that, and then they always, they, they always reserve a certain proportion of the propellant and they test, they do tests on that to make sure that, that it's you know, there's no process control problems. Um, okay, so uh, you still need the three main engines to have uh, enough thrust. The, the boosters each give you about two and a half million pounds thrust, so that's about a, uh, you know, five million pounds to get off the ground. These give you about half a million pound thrust at vacuum, you know, 400 and some odd thousand pounds thrust, so still over a million pounds thrust. And of course, the problem you have during first stage is you've got big gravity losses. You know, you're, if the, the shuttle on the pad weighs about five million, five and a half million pounds with all the propellant, so, you know, if, if, you, uh, if you don't fire your main engines, um, you're barely going to lift off the ground. Actually, I guess it's a little bit less than five million pounds, but uh, but in any case, um, without the three main engines firing, you don't have enough uh, thrust to get into orbit. Now, remember we talked about for deorbit burn, you can have, normally we fire both Ohm's engines. If one of the Ohm's engines is out, you can fire one engine for twice as long, or if they're both out, you can fire the four RCS thrusters for twice as long again. Because you're in orbit, you're weightless, you don't have gravity losses, so you know firing half as many engines for twice as long is completely equivalent. When you're taking off against gravity, that's not true. I mean, if you, if you only have five million pounds of thrust for five million pound payload, you're just going to sit on the pad and burn all your fuel. So, okay, so you need your three engines. So, so if you lose, 
And, and in fact, an, another interesting point, you know, the, the attachment between the external tank and the shuttle, um, that is stressed to assume that you have at least uh, one engine burning it. They, they tell me that if, if the shuttle took off with just the solid boosters and, and you didn't have any thrust, you know, sort of keeping the shuttle up with the external tank, that, that the uh, structural attachment points would fail. So anyway, you need your engines. Okay, so, so what happens if you lose, uh, if you lose uh, an engine early on? If, if, you go, if you're far enough into the launch, you're over the, the main uh, gravity loss segment, uh, usually starting at about you know, three and a half to four minutes into launch. If you lose one engine, uh, you can uh, make it over the ocean, and that's called a transatlantic abort. And when you do that, you know, you're basically, you're flying upside down, you'll do a, a roll maneuver, drop your external tank and come in and land and it's uh, you know you're you're basically going in the same direction which is nice when you're flying a rocket Th these things are hard to turn around but if you're going to do a return to launch site aboard that's exactly what you have to do so this is a procedure that has been analyzed to death in many many computer simulations uh, the basic procedure is you you take off right you lose you lose an engine now it doesn't matter uh, when you lose an engine in the first two and a half minutes you don't do anything while the solid rocket boosters are firing they basically have open loop guidance uh, you know they there's a certain trajectory programmed in uh, and and you can't readjust that trajectory with a closed loop guidance solution to accommodate for any sort of a of a malfunction so you don't even declare an RTLS aboard and that that by the way is done by the crew punching uh, a button which is essentially it's a protected button uh, and you punch that and, and and you can also do it via a computer input if something goes wrong with the button so you declare an RTLS aboard after SRB separation immediately what happens is your your trajectory increases because you want to gain altitude and you'll see why in a minute because what happens now um, you've got you, you've got a pretty hefty downrange velocity already and you've got to turn around and come back uh, you've also got to worry about the disposal of your external tank you don't want your external tank you know if you you turn around uh, and you you come back you're still burning your engines you're still riding your tank you don't want the tank coming down on Melbourne or Disney World or anything like that so the basic procedure is as follows you're you're going out you um, you uh, loft your trajectory a bit once you get far enough out now what you do is you do a powered pitch around very sporty maneuver okay the external tank is here all right now you're now you're flying backwards into your plume everybody has speculated on what that would actually look like all right so now you're now you're flying backwards decelerating okay and as you decelerate of course gravity is starting to push you down so you've got to increase your pitch velocity until finally you're basically you have no more horizontal velocity you're basically just sitting statically on top of your exhaust all right and now you gradually pitch forward and you start to fly back uh, and again you've got to uh, plan your trajectory so that when you drop the tank it's going to come down in the ocean and then if all that goes well now you you enter the heading alignment circle and of course you you're a heavyweight vehicle because whatever payload you had but you you also in the process of the RTLS you dump your ohms tanks and your RCS propellants so that you you want to make yourself as light as possible plus in case you have any problem with landing you don't want your hyperbolic hypergolic uh, propellant tanks to rupture so if all that goes well uh, now you enter the heading alignment circle and you've got a hopefully a, a nominal landing as I say this has been analyzed in high fidelity dynamic simulations 
uh, the crew practice it, it over and over again. Everybody knows the procedures. Nobody wants to be the first crew to try this out. Um, you know, before STS-1, uh, you remember we talked about how there were lots of problems with the tiles falling off. And so I remember one of the people very high up in NASA, don't remember if it was the administrator or one of the deputies, or suggested that maybe, maybe the safest thing to do would be to do a planned RTLS. Because an RTLS, of course, you don't get up to those high velocities, and so you don't have any thermal problems. And so if, if a whole bunch of tiles had fallen off on the launch pad, you could safely do an RTLS. Well, obviously, they did not appreciate the, uh, the difficulties of doing an RTLS, and that suggestion was not taken up we basically decided we were not going to fly until the um, um, until we had confidence that the tiles were going to stay on okay cut forward to February of 1996 which was my fifth and final shuttle flight so I was the second flight engineer so I was sitting right behind the the pilot who's responsible for the main engine performance now I should tell you, we've had in the course of the 100 and some odd, 114 shuttle flights, we've had four pad shutdowns, pad aborts. Um, and I think we've talked about that briefly. The main engines turn on six seconds before the solids. That uh, just reviewing that that does two things it gives you time it gives the engines time to come up to full thrust and then you can perform checks on them to make sure that they're operating properly before you commit yourself to flight and of course it gives time for the because uh, of the asymmetric thrust it gives time for the what we call the twang that the whole shuttle stack goes forward and then back and then when you get to the vertical you light the boosters in fact when they had the first test firing on the pad before STS-1 one of the reasons that they wanted to do that in, in, in addition to just confirming that everything was uh, was working right they, they, they really wanted precise timing on the twang people had calculated it but that's not something you want to get wrong so they, they wanted an experimental verification um, so the um, of the four pad shutdowns um, two of them were caused by instrumentation and two of them were were real engine problems I remember the first one was it was the last flight before what would have been my first flight back in 1984 um, and uh, you know uh, the main engine cutoff is called Miko. Okay, so eight and a half minutes into the flight, and uh, after they had a pad abort, the flight engineer called to uh, uh, mission control. Uh, we have Miko. Uh, somehow, I thought we'd be a little bit higher. Um, and of course, when that happens, now you've got to pull all the engines out, take them back to the shop, bring in new engines, and it's about a two or three week uh, stand down. And the crew has to go back to Houston, and of course, all of your friends and family are there, and they they have to go home, and it's 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 no fun. But it, I mean, nobody complains if it, it's safe. So okay, so so we're sitting on the pad, we're counting down. Uh, and ev everything was was on schedule. It was in, in fact the first of my five flights that it had zero problems, zero delays. You know, we were going on the day that was predicted on the on on the time. Countdown to six seconds. You can feel the engines. Everything starts to rumble. The engines start up. Um, there's a um, kind of a, we, we call it a steam gauge it's it's a, a vertical bar which shows the engine power uh, center and right engines come up to 100 percent the left engine comes up to 40 percent pilot calls out left engine at 40 percent um, you know in times like this your mind is working pretty fast so um, uh, you know I remember thinking to myself oh damn you know we're gonna have a pad shut down um, we got to go back to Houston, back to the simulators, you know, all, all of the, I mean, you know, stupid things to be thinking about at that time, but that's, that's sort of the, the way it works. Um, and all of a sudden, kaboom, you know, I feel this big kick in my back, the solids have lit. You know, what in the hell is going on? You know, we're supposed to have a pad abort. Now we're, we're, we're going with uh, 
uh, with a, an engine and actually um, when when you're going through maximum dynamic pressure, max Q, the engines throttle down to about 65%. And there is a malfunction if one of your engines gets stuck, it's called getting stuck in the bucket, in the thrust bucket. If it doesn't come back to full power, your RTLS abort. Well, we were, we were taking off with one engine at 40%. So, uh, you know, I sort of dawned on me that you know, we were going to be the first crew to do an RTLS. So at that point, I start going for my checklists, and the pilot calls to the ground. Uh, you know, we we have ignition, left engine at 40%. Uh, and so for about the first 15 seconds or so, you know, I was just had barely time to get out the the RTLS checklist and start getting ready to read the procedures and um, and then it turns out that the ground has more insight than the crew does and it turns out that there's several sensors uh, one of which feeds that gauge but in fact that sensor had gone bad and in fact the left engine was performing nominally and the the ground was able to confirm that from various, by, both by the other sensors and by looking at the acceleration, and, and so everything was okay. I put away the checklist and enjoyed the ride. But it's, uh, you know, first of all, it was kind of a scary situation, but, but it also shows the difficulty. Now, suppose, you know, we as the crew had been responsible for declaring an abort. Um, if you're going to build in a si system where this is the crew's responsibility, then you better design your instrumentation so that the crew has all the instrumentation required to make that decision correctly. And similarly, uh, if this were going to be an automatic abort, um, you know, how you've got to have failure detection, identification, reconfiguration, so that you know, you the, the last thing you want, I mean, it, is to go into an abort situation when you don't have to, because there's no way that an abort is going to be anywhere near as safe as a nominal mission. So, uh, it, I, I think it, it was a, uh, an, you know, obviously it, it it, it's just a good story now, but I think it, it does have something to uh, to inform about um, how you're going to have to design abort systems. And and you know, as as both uh, Aaron Cohen and, and Chris Kraft said, that uh, although I mean the astronauts always felt comfortable with their abort system, but I'm not sure. Uh, that, that all the people in mission control were quite so comfortable knowing the things that might go wrong with it. And in fact, um, he, as he said, they always breathed a sigh of relief when, after first stage, when the abort rocket would, would uh, detach and, and fire itself away. Um, yeah? When one of the engines is not working, or not working properly, I guess the other two engines are doing I tried to do the work Well, they certainly will throttle up to 109% if they need to, but but they can't make up for the first engine when you're in the first stage and you have lots of gravity losses. In fact, up to about, mm, it, when you get, like I said, to about three and a half, four minutes, then, then you have a, enough altitude and downrange velocity to make it across. And then at some point you get to uh, the situation where where you basically gained your altitude and although you're you're not at orbital velocity yet so you still have some gravity losses the gravity losses are small enough that if you um, have a loss of an engine you can still make it to a lower orbit that's called abort to orbit and it's uh, a ATO and, and you'll hear the call press to ATO, single engine, pre uh, no, press to ATO uh, means that you can now make it to a lower orbit, which is the safest thing to do, with two engines. And then a little little bit later on, uh, you'll hear like single engine TAL, which means if you lose two engines, with only one engine, you can make it across the Atlantic. And then later on, you'll hear single engine ATO, and then finally single engine, then you'll also hear a press to MECO, which means at this point, if you, if you lose an engine, you can make it to your your nominal orbit and 
usually about the last call is single engine press to Miko, which means even if you lose two engines, you can still make it to uh, to Miko. What happens then if, if there's an instrumentation problem? Uh, which I mean, in the in the cockpit you're seeing some values that are not right. The but crew. How does that? The crew will never on their own. The, the crew will never declare an abort on their own, because it, it's just realized that uh, the ground has has so much more. Infrared. The only exception is if you lose calm. You know, if if we had lost calm. Um, you know, and we saw our engine at 40%, and we we didn't. I mean, there there were a few other displays which the pilot was starting to call up, and and it could be that he would have figured it out, perhaps, perhaps not. Um, but that's the only circumstance under which uh, the crew would would make that call. Yeah. There was one about ACO um, at some stage. What happened there? Did they, did they yeah. manage to make it? Yeah, I, I was trying to remember. If, did, did I talk? Did I talk about that in class? Well, all right, I'll, I'll run through that because it, it was again a, a very interesting story. You know, you have one one of the the, th the things that you're afraid about is that if things go bad in a hurry in an engine, that an engine can actually blow up. And you know, it's one thing if if an engine gets shut down, now you're just flying on two engines. But if an engine blows up and takes out your whole rear section, you've had a bad day. Okay, so the instrumentation is biased towards an early shutdown. If you if you sense that something's going wrong, shut it down. You know, we've got intact aborts, you know, better to err on the, the side of safety, even if that might potentially put you into an abort situation. Um, and I, I'm, I'm trying to exactly reconstruct it. it. The thing is that if you if you lose one engine, all right, so now you are abort ATO. Um, now, if you lose a second engine, uh, you might be in a situation where uh, certainly you can't make it to orbit, and because you've changed your trajectory, you might not be able to make it to a good transatlantic uh, landing site. So, at that point, if you have lost one engine, uh, there is a switch on the center console where you can override the engine shutdown command. So what you're now saying is, we, we're in an unsurvivable situation if we only have one engine. And therefore, we'll take the extra chance of getting an improper, an instrumentation-caused engine shutdown we're not going to take that chance, so we are going to disable the ability of instrumentation to shut down the engine, and we'll just take our chances. The ground will continue the calculation, and as soon as you get to the point where, where you have the capability of doing a single engine TAL or a single engine abort to orbit, you, you re-enable the instrumentation. So what happened, the, um, the shuttle launched, uh, I don't, it, it must have been about four or five minutes in a launch because they, they, they lost an engine, uh, it shut down automatically, they're now abort to orbit, uh, lower, lower orbit, but they were abort to orbit. Take the switch, put it to inhibit. Uh, now, the main propulsion flight controller was very good. She she realized right away that it was an instrumentation problem. You know, because sometimes if if you you can see certain trends or you see things change in a way that tells you that this is not the way a real engine behaves. That this is more typical of instrumentation. So so she suspected she had had an instrumentation problem. All right now they get a little further along in the launch um, where they could have potentially done a they they were they were too far to land in the normal TAL sites, which were in the daytime on, on the west coast of Africa. Um, but they could have made a nighttime landing at some emergency airport in the Congo, I think it was, uh, if they had lost another engine. 
<coughs> but by the by the flight rules, uh, they take the switch back to enable, so that now because you can safely quote safely lose a second engine, um, you want to protect yourself against an explosive uh, situation. So now they're enabled. All right now, the flight controller sees that the instrumentation on one of the other two engines is starting to go bad the way the first one was, uh, and she realized that you know in about 15 seconds that engine was going to shut down. So she immediately called the flight director and said, you know, flight, take the switch back to inhibit. And luckily, you know, this is where the discipline becomes very important. You know, the flight didn't get into a long, involved discussion about why do you want to do that, you know, what's going on. Just said, you know, Capcom engine switch to inhibit they took it and sure enough you know the instrumentation went bad but the en the engine was okay they got to orbit then they used some of their ohms propellant to raise their orbit a little bit and they had a that was a space lab mission and they had a they had a good mission but uh, yeah the flight controller actually won a big award for that because she she really saved the day um, so yeah that's the closest we ever came to a uh, a real intact abort yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is on going back to the um, return to launch site. Does the all of the main engine propellant get used up before the tank is dropped, or do you not burn some of the? Propellant? You know, I I don't know the answer to that. I don't. And, uh, the other one is on the the pad with your flight. Wouldn't the sequencing computer shut down the other engines if it detected that one of them had failed? Well, and so it must have used if, the good sensor. Yeah, that's that's right. And and luckily, our our little gauge was just fed by one. I mean, and, and you know, in retrospect, you can say, well, probably that's not a good way to design it, but that's the way it was designed. You're right. If if the engine controller senses with a majority or however they they pro I, I don't know the, the details of the guts of the software there but if if it's convinced that one of the engines is not working right it shuts down all three engines which is as a you know that's what what happened uh, on four occasions okay yeah when you talked about the force pitch over mm -hmm. the return to launch side is that just the gimbling of the main engines that gives you that yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're off the you're off the solids at that point, and that's the thing. That, I mean, with the solids, there's such an enormous thrust, and and the uh, you know the aerodynamic loads are huge. You don't want to deviate from your planned trajectory because they. One of the things that that they do is they program in load relief for the aerodynamic surfaces. They they take the the day of winds launch, and you know if you have wind shears or or you know other atmospheric you know high high jet streams that you're going to fly through they actually program the elevons and the and the body flap uh, to move in such a way as to relieve the aerodynamic loading on the wings and that's pre-programmed in it's not it's not a closed loop it's it's totally open loop so you don't want to change the trajectory once you've put all that load relief in How long is that it's pretty quick. It's about 10 seconds, if I remember from the simulator. You know, it's it's a it's a sporty maneuver. I'll tell you. I mean, <laughs> you know, you're no RCS. Oh, the RCS is is trivial compared to what you're getting out of. You know, you got you got 500,000 pounds coming of out of each engine. The RCS is a the primary RCS is 750 pounds. So you know. That's, uh, but they, like I said, they they do then open up the RCS as you're flying back, and what they do is they open up all the engines so that you have symmetrical thrust, so that so that it doesn't, you know, you're you're firing out of both sides, so that you just the idea is just to deplete the tanks as much as possible. Okay, um, the second uh, technical area that that uh, I had been hoping that Al Louvier would get into. Um, and, and didn't have a chance to was the, the payload bay doors, which are a fascinating mechanism. And it's also going to be a segue into EVA because um, originally it, it was a strange situation. It's, it's kind of hard to relate back to that now when you look at how many successful EVAs have been done and you know the Hubble repair and the building of space station and all the other things. But um, 
management um, at Johnson Space Center was not particularly friendly to EVA back in the 70s. Now, I asked Chris Kraft about that and at first he, he, he denied it. He said, well, I always liked EVA. He said, well, maybe it was the, it was the management of the astronaut office that didn't like EVA. Um, he did admit that Bob Gilruth, who was the director of Johnson Space Center at the time, this is when Chris Kraft was head of flight operations, uh, Bob Gilruth definitely did not like EVA. He was afraid of it. He didn't, didn't think it was safe. Despite the fact that, you know, back in 1973, EVA had saved the entire Skylab project. I don't know, hopefully most of you know that story. It's, I know it's ancient history, but, um, and, and clearly we had done a lot of safe EVAs on the surface of the moon, but, uh, but basically EVA was looked at, it was expensive, it was potentially hazardous, uh, you know, you, you, given the things that the shuttle was supposed to do in the original planning, uh, mainly launch satellites, launch pieces of the space station, uh, that went away, launch Defense Department satellites, commercial satellites. You know, EVA was not really part of, of the big picture in, in planning. and. Um, Although they did design a, an airlock for the shuttle, um, there were you know, real questions of how much preparation do we have to do for EVA? Do we really even need it? You know, maybe we could save some weight by, by not having spacesuits aboard. Um, uh, okay. So, um, oh, I know what I was going to do. I was going to set up the remote here. Let me do that. Hold on just a sec. So that's where we finally ended up. This is that's the Hubble telescope. This is the the payload bay side of the payload bay. So I mean, obviously EVA became a very successful activity. But um, this is these are the payload bay doors. This is in the orbiter processing facility, um, and. Uh, one of the things, uh, well, I have a picture of, of uh, closing the door, but the, the mechanism of these doors is, is extraordinary. There, there are two motors, one at the front and one at the back of each. Uh, each of the motors has two drive units and they work through a differential so that if one of the motors fails, the other one can still drive, although at half the speed, you know, just similar to the way a car works. Um, there's, a, there's a long torsion rod which runs the length of the shuttle, uh, and then that torsion rod is attached to these uh, bars over here. I'm, I'm sorry the, the, the picture was scanned in and it's, it's not terribly sharp, but as the torsion bar twists, then these rods lift up the payload bay door and bring it uh, to a close. And the mechanism, this is the best picture I could find, and you notice there's a strong back because as, as was mentioned, the, the doors can't support their own weight in, in 1G. But the, uh, the system of latches here, you have to remember that the payload bay can expand and contract by several inches due to thermal uh, environment. And, and so you have to design a latch system that can accommodate this thermal behavior. It was, it was an incredible mechanical challenge and, and I, the, the complexity of this system, I mean, I, I'm always amazed when I, I look at how the thing works. Uh, I, I have a schematic of, of them later which you can look at, but basically you close the doors and then the first thing you do is, is you want to close the latches on either end and then there's also center line latches and I think Al Louvier did discuss the fact that these payload bay doors are part of the structural uh, element of the shuttle during re-entry. You cannot re-enter if the doors are not just closed but latched. You need them latched for structural strength. So there's a series of um, bollards here in a little 
protrusions which these latches grab on and the they, they've designed the rigging of of this uh, of the rod such that the uh, the latches that are close to the hinge line actually close before the latches that are further away. So it's a sequential closing of the latches, all with a single mechanism, so that you basically you you pull the the uh, part of the door that's closest to the, the torque rod, you latch that down first, and then it's kind of a zipper effect where then you, you pull it down so that even if the, the door is a little bit warped thermally, uh, you'll get the door to close properly. You wouldn't want to close this latch first and then have the door in a situation you know where it was buckled out whereas uh, here and then of course the center line latch because of the thermal expansion you can have the doors coming together like that or or like that and, and you've got to have center line latches that can accommodate for that so it's really quite uh, quite an, an incredible design and, and Al Louvier had said that he was going to talk about it but he didn't have time to well anyway um, there's plenty of redundancy in here because there's there's these double motors, but because this is so critical, uh, people started to uh, look at you know suppose you got some debris stuck in the mechanism. Doesn't matter how many motors you are, you you can't get it closed. Suppose uh, suppose the motor one the, the motors jam uh, on one side. Now the other motor isn't going to be able to to drive it. So various things were done to allow for. Or EVA intervention and in the early shuttle flights this was the only thing that the crew trained for with EVA it was just payload bay door contingencies okay so um, for instance uh, the uh, PDU the, the drive unit uh, this is the uh, payload bay door drive unit uh, or PLB DU that's what we call a nested acronym okay that's that's part of the part of the game there so you have to go out and you actually you peel away the liners of the of the payload bay and and inside here there's a little mechanism where you can uh, insert a special tool and twist it and that actually disconnects that motor drive unit from the torque so that so that it can uh, it can turn freely um, and you know, I, I hope when you look at this, these things, you'll get some sense of the complexity of these mechanisms. Uh, and so, what what we do, um, you know, for training, of course, they they build mock-ups of this in the water, and we also look at the real shuttle down in Florida to actually see these units. And for for the people who are on the EVA crew, you spend a lot of time crawling around the payload bay, getting intimately familiar with with a lot of the actual mechanisms, just in case you actually have to go out and do something something with it. Um, you know, other then then suppose the problem is not with the uh, with the drive unit but but that uh, one of these latches gets jammed up. So this is actually a, a tube cutter. It's a little hard to see, but I don't know if, if you're familiar with the things that are on a ratchet and 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 as it gradually cuts you, you push the blade in uh, bit by bit and then eventually you cut away and this gives you an idea of some of the other they just gave us a lot of a lot of tools you know a, a pin extractor a crowbar you know vice grips um, you know you name it uh, how much that crowbar cost well, the crowbar probably cost about uh, ten dollars at Sears, and then they had to put on all of the Velcro and the tethers to go in the tool thing, and that probably cost a few hundred dollars. And then they had to make a drawing of it, and you know how it goes. <laughs> so, I, you know, EVA is very expensive because everything has to be custom made. I mean, that's one of the things that, because of the the constraints of the suits and and the gloves, uh, you can't in most cases just use regular tools um, and as I say everything is tethered and I'll, I'll show you pictures later we have a little mini workstation they, they built little receptacles on the side of the suit because it's a hard upper torso which can take a certain amount of load and so you plug uh, basically a tool caddy into your suit and then you you hang all of these tools on the tool caddy and, and you'll see some pictures later of, of, uh, of how that works so then if it, so if, if you if the motors don't work and 
you've now freed the door so that the door can move, but you have no motor to drive it. So now we have a, uh, a mechanical winch and a, and a rope on it, and so you, you uh, I'm not making this up. <laughs> um, so you actually run the rope up. These are the, the, the little uh, bollards that the latches catch on to. You run the rope up over that, and then you have to crawl out on the, um, on the payload bay door, which would be a lot of fun, but... Um, and, and attach it here, and then you actually wind it closed. And, and we do this in the water. I mean, they, they had, this is all fully mocked up, and, and uh, yeah. Do you, what do you do if you have trouble opening the doors? Just up and up? Well, if you can't open the doors, then you come home. Yeah. You wouldn't want to. I mean, if there's something seriously wrong with the doors, you better come home. Because, you know. Yeah, we can do this to get them closed, but you don't want to purposely put yourself in that situation if you know you have a problem beforehand. Yeah. How many people would it take to go from the closed building to the building? That's the problem. We think it could be done with one person. Normally, we only go out with two, but in the in the uh, orbital flight test, the first four flights only had two crew members. One of them was EVA trained. Uh, and then, what happens if, the, if you get the doors closed, but the latches don't latch? So they gave us, they, they actually made latches that we could put on by hand. So this is, these are the latches for the side, and, and this is the schematic that sort of shows, you know, these, the, the latches go in the rollers in that order, one, two, three, and four. And, and again, I, you know, the way they designed this so that they, they actually close in sequence, but you only have one drive unit is really, I mean, it's just a beautiful mechanical system. Uh, but if they don't close, then uh, you take this, and, and I won't go into the details, but you have to spring it around at least two of those, and that will give you the structural strength uh, to come home. And then if the center line latches don't close, again, you can look at the mechanism here, and they have yet a different tool. Now, this is actually shown on its side, but this is actually on the top. And, and this is a bitch in the water because, you know, yeah, your suit is weightless, but the tool is not. And so you're holding this tool, and, and so when you're holding the tool, you want to sink to the bottom, and, and so you're trying to hold on with one hand, and you have a, you have a tether, so you, you try to tie yourself to, to the top there so that you're kind of hanging on the tether. But then, depending on how, how your way out is, you know, if you move, if you move this big tool back and forth, your, your body is sort of rocking back and forth and 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 you're working above your head so uh, I mean it's everybody has to do it I mean if you're gonna be an EVA crew member and you can't do this job you're disqualified but it's nobody likes it it's it's a real pain anyway so that that is basically how EVA got sold to the shuttle system. Um, I'll show you a few pictures of general EVA activities to give you an idea of how the system works. And then I want to go into the question of um, the uh, interaction between EVA and the pressurization and the, the environmental control system of the rest of the shuttle. Because again, it, this is a systems engineering problem and you can't in most cases do one thing without it having an impact on something else. So, um, you know, I talked about doing all those training. Now, now we're stepping 10 years into the future, so that's, that's training for, uh, for the Hubble telescope. And actually, the telescope is so, so tall that we, we couldn't get the whole thing in. The pool wasn't deep enough, so we had to actually cut it in half, and we would work on one half and then work on the other half. Um, and uh, you know, here's an example. This is this is uh, me installing the wide field planetary camera. Now, um, the training people normally see the the, the water tank. The you it you're not weightless. You you all understand that. If you if you go upside down, the blood rushes to your head. If you're holding on to tools, the tools will fall down. Um, and more to the point, well, and of course, you don't have these guys when you're out in space, but <laughs> angels, if you saw them out there, I suppose. I don't know. Anyway, um, if you... Um, 
if you're moving around large objects, uh, they, they have uh, resistance from the water. So you need to get a sense of how easy it is to push things around so you don't get things moving too fast. So we also train on air bearing floors. Uh, this is a mass model of the whiff pick same mass moments of inertia uh, so that you know and I'm, I'm up here on a, a weight relief system and and you can really get a sense of what it feels like and 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 so you, you're trying to build a kind of a muscle memory so that when you get in space you're not trying to push things as hard as um, as you push them in the water and you also remember that if you want to stop something, you also have to be able to exert a force on it, whereas in the water, all you have to do is to stop pushing. So, uh, now we go into space, and we're ready for the EVA, and I'll, I'll sort of take you through what's involved to give you a sense of the complexity of this system. Um, so, first of all, our tools. Um, that, that's what I looked like before all the cosmic rays made my hair fall out. <laughs> it's just one of the hazards of space flight. So, okay, so here you see the kind of tool caddies. This is, this is for a, uh, a ratchet uh, wrench, and, and we had about 250 different tools, about 100 planned to use, and the rest were for contingencies. And, and we had to take them all out, so we had them on, we call this our fish stringer. You sort of like, you know, Portuguese fishermen, fisher wives hang all the fish on the string and then hang them out so and then we we take take this out uh, on, on the fish stringer um, so this is this is the airlock at launch uh, and the, it's uh, totally packed and in fact we had four space suits rather than, than the normal two so there wasn't a whole lot of room and first thing you go in is you go and you start checking the various systems and then you have to unpack everything and uh, and move it into the uh, flight deck. So this is that's story we, we went out uh, together. Um, and this is the uh, the hard upper torso. This is looking down into the the inside of the spacesuit. Um, the back of the spacesuit. Um, there's battery and lithium hydroxide CO2 scrubber. Uh, CO2 scrubber has to be replaced after every EVA. It's good for about 12 hours. Um, and the batteries, uh, normally if you're only going out once, you don't worry about recharging the batteries. But since we were doing successive everyday EVAs, we would have to take the batteries out every night, charge them, take the ones that had been charged, put them into the suits that are going to go out the next day, and just keep keeping track of which cartridges have been used and which batteries have been charged and how much. I mean, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of overhead effort just in managing all of this equipment. Um, and and we, we had practiced doing this a lot on the ground, as you can imagine, before, before we went up. Okay, so the morning of the EVA, um, you get up early, <coughs> eat uh, as big a breakfast as you can because you're not going to get much to eat for the next eight hours. Um, these are radiation monitors. Uh, for Hubble, we were actually up at about 600 kilometers, which is as high as the shuttle ever goes. So we, we got uh, really the highest radiation dose that you can get on the shuttle on a, on a normal mission. It was about between one and two rems, which is not, you know, no big health problem, but typically the, the dose on a shuttle flight at, at a more typical 300 kilometers is, is more like uh, tens or maybe a little over 100 millirems. So uh, they, did, they did want us to take the radiation monitor. So now we're in the mid-deck, and, and when you see these pictures, you get a sense of when you're doing an EVA, the entire mid-deck is just full of stuff. I mean, there there is so much equipment. You know, you've got the, the 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 pants units floating over there, and plus the two extra suits and and all of the auxiliary equipment. You try to keep things organized. So then there's the uh, for thermal control. Um, the original space Apollo spacesuits were designed for daytime use on the moon when it's very hot and 
in addition people are walking so they're they're putting a lot of metabolic heat into the suit and so they were very concerned about being able to uh, have sufficient cooling so they developed a very very efficient uh, sublimator cooling unit you, you have a little layer of ice uh, that's continually fed from the bottom and it sublimates and that that basically is how you get rid of your heat and then you run your cooling water underneath that ice and it and it cools off and then it it is run through the, the they call it LCVG liquid cooling and ventilation garment which has uh, lots of um, Tigon tubing that goes through it so that it carries the cold water next to your skin and also it um, the the oxygen that comes into the suit comes through the helmet over the back of your head so it flows over your face so you breathe the fresh oxygen but you 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 would like to get ventilation through the entire suit so you don't uh, build up lots of humidity in your in your arms and legs so what you do is the return valve actually comes through these air ducts and so the the return is picked up at the bottom of your your arms and and at the bottom of your legs so that ensures that the air does get circulated through your arms and legs but when we started doing shuttle EVAs uh, metabolically you're not nearly as stressed plus you spend half your time almost half your time in the dark and it gets really really cold and uh, this has been a constant problem we, we were uh, we were very concerned about uh, and, and here here's an interesting systems problem to show how everything relates to one another when you open up the doors of the Hubble telescope if direct sunlight comes in it will cause an outgassing of the internal material which could uh, which could pollute the ultraviolet mirrors the ultraviolet mirror ultraviolet optics are very very sensitive to organic contamination so under no circumstances could we have sunlight penetrating the interior of the telescope but we were going to be spending a lot of time with the doors open so how do you ensure that you'll never get the sun coming in well um, you know the the Hubble telescope is sitting up here like this so if that's the Sun just make sure that the belly of the orbiter is always pointed towards the Sun then you never have to worry about Sun coming into the telescope but what you do have to worry about is that uh, well during the day side of your orbit you know if the Sun is over here and the earth is over here uh, during the day your payload bay is going to be pointed towards the earth and so you 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 basically uh, have a radiative heat exchange with something that's at about 20 degrees C no big deal you go around the other side now you're in at nighttime you're pointed at deep space and so you're radiating towards absolute zero or three degrees Kelvin and um, and that is a concern and you get very cold they were predicting temperatures of, of as much as 150 below zero uh, Celsius um, we were very concerned not only were our hands going to get cold but some of our tools might not work so uh, we we pushed very hard for a, a test in a thermal vacuum chamber where we can actually go through the, our tools are stored in a toolbox outside in the cargo bay and we wanted to go through take going out taking the tools out and they're, they're of course they're held in there because they have launch locks and, and uh, so there's there's little uh, pit pins and latching mechanisms uh, that you have to remove so that you can get the tools out so I went in to do the first test and what it is, is it's a vacuum chamber and the walls are painted black and they can run liquid nitrogen through the vacuum chamber um, and and they could cool it down to the lowest temperatures that we were expecting to experience I opened up the toolbox and about 75 percent of the tools the the launch release mechanisms were just frozen shut I couldn't I couldn't get them out so that started to get people's attention so they sent the engineers in to uh, to redo some of the tolerance and they played around with the lubrication a little bit um, then Story went in a week later to do his run um, and and he was able to get most of the 
tools out. Uh, I think he got all the tools out actually, uh, because he, he I, I was only in for a few hours because once we realized that it wasn't working, I, I came out. He was in there, and and I remember he said at one point he said, you know, just holding on to these tools, my hands are really really cold. And I don't know, about an hour or so later, someone asked him how his hands are, and he said, oh, they're fine, they've warmed up. Well. Stories from the South. Um, those of you with experience in, in, in winter know that if your hands are really cold and after a while you don't feel them anymore, it doesn't necessarily mean that they've warmed up. When they took him out of the chamber, his hands were deep purplish black and he had severe frostbite. Um, to the point where, I mean, they sent him up to Alaska to some frostbite specialists, and they were, in the end, he was very fortunate. He, he got off with no, no major permanent damage, and he was able to fly. But, as you can imagine, that got serious management attention. So, gloves now have electrical heating units in them, but we didn't have that available. Um, what we had to do was to change the attitude profile so that uh, we were basically um, pointing towards the earth. Uh, now that's generally okay when if you're pointing towards the earth uh, and the sun is at coming from from your belly you're not going to uh, hurt the, the shuttle but um, a quarter way around the earth you do have the possibility now that the sun is going to uh, hit the telescope so what they had to do was to do two orbital maneuvers uh, every two attitude maneuvers every orbit in order to basically keep us in a more benign thermal attitude for the EVA but to prevent the sun from shining on the telescope and we didn't have the reaction control system propellant budget to support that. Remember we were going into a high orbit which meant we needed to use a lot of Ohm's fuel to get up there and, and we needed a lot of propellant for the deorbit because the higher you are the, the more you have to burn to get down. Um, and so the uh, propulsion com and, and flight control community uh, together with the pilots got together and, and developed a special way that we could do maneuvers using only half the number of jets that you normally use. And so this is a, a you know an interconnection between the thermal environment of EVA and the reaction control propellant budget which nobody you know in the early days of flight planning would ever have believed that there's this sort of a connection but it's just another good example of how these systems all play with one another and you can't make changes in one with without another um, I'm going to finish this unit and then we'll take a little break and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll do the last part. So, okay, so uh, process of getting in the suit. First you get in LTA, lower torso assembly, basically the pants. And of course, this is one time when you can put your pants on both legs at a time. Okay, you can't do that too often. But again, look, you know, look at the, uh, at the uh, mid deck here. It's, it's full. This, by the way, is the uh, escape pole. We, we talked about this uh, earlier. Uh, during launch and entry, it's actually bolted into position so that it, it heads, it'll take you out the door. Um, but once you're in orbit, you just sort of float it up and out of the way, and, and it's just kind of Velcroed to the ceiling. And of course, it has no weight up there, so it, it's perfectly happy. OK, so you get in the, uh, in, in the pants. Now, the suit is the upper torso of the suit is, is uh, attached to the wall inside the airlock. So now you have to float into the airlock. Uh, and that's what you're looking at when you're getting into the suit. And there's a lot of connections you have to make. This is the water bag. Um, this is the uh, calm connection for your, your Snoopy cap. Uh, this is the water and air connection, which you have to hook into your uh, LCVG. And these are the arms which you have to get into. And the problem in the, in the design here is uh, your shoulders are wider than uh, your chest. So when you're actually inside the suit, you want the distance between these two arms to be conformal with your armpits. Because it, you know if it's out here, that, that, that cuts way down on your mobility. But if it's too narrow, 
you can't get into it. Okay, so that's that's the basic design problem in in this sort of a of a suit. Now the Russians have a rear entry suit, which doesn't uh, doesn't have that problem. So you know it's 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 always a challenge, and and you really have to push and struggle to get in, and and uh, you know eventually they they wanted to design this suit so that you could one person could get in uh, by themselves, but it, it can't be done. I mean you can get in like this, but you you just can't pull up the uh, the waist ring and and attach it by yourself. Uh, nobody's nobody's been able to do that. So it's a great feeling of accomplishment when you finally <laughs> get inside. Then uh, you put your helmet on. Uh, so now you're starting to see what we're dealing with because we have to take all this stuff outside. Um, in addition to the tools that are already outside, these are the plugs which we put the mini workstation. We haven't put it on quite yet, but uh, uh, it's just a, a whole bunch of equipment which which you have to manage. And at this point, um, we uh, were breathing pure. We purged the suit with with an oxygen flow. Now remember, the uh, we're we're at uh, an atmospheric pressure or almost an atmospheric pressure. I'll get into that later of pure oxygen. So that also puts very serious flammability constraints. Although when you go outside, you're only at four psi. Uh, when you're inside here, you you're at the full cabin pressure. And actually, in order to do your leak check, you have to go to four psi above cabin pressure so you're actually working at at above one atmosphere of pressure of pure oxygen so that's a very serious flammability design constraint uh, and we have to uh, sit and breathe pure oxygen then for about 40 minutes to get the nitrogen out of our blood and again I'll be discussing this this whole atmospheric and, and bends problem but if if you don't when you when you drop down to 4 psi the nitrogen in your blood bubbles out and you get the bends just like a diver who comes up too fast from uh, from a dive um, so just one or two pictures uh, of what went on outside uh, there's Hubble, I was changing some fuels there. It was kind of neat working underneath the solar panel. Those were the old ones which we took off and replaced the next day. Um, but you have to be really careful because you don't want to bang against it. And, and of course you can't see above your head, so we always have other people looking at us. This is a kind of situation where if, if you had a little heads up display where you could get this sort of a view to show what you're really doing, it would really improve your situational awareness. Uh, but at the moment we don't have that so it takes not just the people outside but the people inside paying full attention reading procedures um, historically we carried all of our procedures on a cuff checklist like so uh, but the procedures for Hubble and some of the other flights are so complex that you just can't do it so nowadays um, these are just emergency procedures I'll, I'll pass this around you can I, I, I would like it back yes. but, okay. um, uh, let's see after putting in the new whiff pick um, ground had to do some tests on it so I got Claude to fly me out over the arm and we had a an old one of the old lunar Hasselblad cameras which they let us carry normally we just use Nikons on the shuttle but we let them let us take a they, they let us take a Hasselblad um, and so that gives a, a view of what the payload bay looks like EVA there's a story over here working on one of the other things the earth is not flat don't worry about the picture it's, I, I I uh, went around it many times. It, um, and then, I mean, some, some parts of EVA, I, you know, I really should share it because, you know, it just gets really spectacular. You know, this is about 50 feet, I don't know whether to say above or below or, you know, whatever of the shuttle, but, you know, you're just out there in the middle of nowhere. And at this point, uh, I was the free floater. One of one of the people is always attached to the end of the arm, which is good when you have to move around big pieces of equipment because now you can react the forces with your feet. When you're a free floater, one arm always has either you're in a foot restraint, which limits your mobility, or one hand has to uh, actually be holding you so that you can react forces. What was really neat, 
of course, we, we are attached by, uh, by a waist tether, which is then attached to a, a long reel of stainless steel. But, but you, can, you can set it uh, so that it, it, the, the springiness is taken out. And, and so I could basically, and I did from time to time, just sort of let go. And, and it, it, it's a really neat feeling because, um, you know, one, once you convince yourself that you're not going to fall down, um, which, which I'm enough of a physicist to, to understand the orbital mechanics, but nevertheless, the first time I let go, it, 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 it was an interesting feeling. But the thing is, when, you, when you're holding on to something, whether by your feet or your hands, of course, the shuttle is so much more massive that, that you you feel yourself physically related you're controlled by the shuttle and so the shuttle is your point of reference you know maybe the shuttle is in orbit but you're attached to the shuttle as soon as i let go the physics totally changes and 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 it was really this transformation into being a a human satellite i mean i really felt like i was a satellite now i wasn't attached to the shuttle and and um, and sometimes, you know, if I could turn around so that I, before I let go, so I didn't see the shuttle, it was really kind of neat, especially at night, you know, just sort of floating there and all the stars and everything, so, yeah. They build in time for you to be able to kind of no, do that kind no. of thing. <laughs> they don't build in the time, but again, you know, we, we um, like in, in this case, uh, two days before on our, on, on stories in my last EVA, we had replaced, not replaced, we had, these are the magnetometers up at the top, the, the gross maneuver of the shuttle uh, of, of Hubble is done by reaction wheels, but the reaction wheels, uh, when they get spinning too fast, you have to be able to desaturate them, so they have magnetic torquers, uh, these long torque rods, which create a magnetic field. They interact with, there's, there's no jets on, on Hubble because it would cause pollution of the optics. So you need magnetometers at, up at the top to sense the magnetic field in order to operate the torquers. Um, the magnetometers were never never designed to be replaced. They weren't supposed to fail. Well, both of them failed in the first couple of years. Uh, we couldn't take them off, so they designed two new magnetometers that we can actually insert and bolt on on top of the old ones, and then we took the, the electrical and data connections and, and uh, hooked them up. But I noticed on that day, because you know we, we were very concerned with quality control, making sure, first of all, that we didn't break anything that wasn't always all already broken but also to look for any signs of damage because you know this was a, a telescope which was supposed to be maintained um, we saw a little bit of paint chipping off the outside of the old magnetometers they were concerned that they might float around and get into the optics so we made we went into the payload bay on the next day the other EVA team and they cut off some of this gold insulation material from one of the thermal enclosures that that some of the equipment was in and I'm not supposed to stand in front of the I keep forgetting that uh, so um, we, we made those covers and then we had to go up and uh, uh, and install them but uh, you know, actually, after we installed them, then the ground wanted photographic documentation. So we took pictures, and then the, the crew inside got their telephoto lenses, and they took a lot of pictures, and then they got the, the television camera on the end of the arm to take pictures. And so during all that time, you know, you do have a little bit of free time just to sort of enjoy the environment. It'd be a shame not to, because it's such a spectacular place. Yeah. Uh, how do you work when there's no light in there in the back? Um, these are, let me, let me turn the, uh, the laser pointer on here. Oh no! What did I do? That's a good time for a break. Okay? Take, a, take a two minute break. Good grief. And then, uh, of course, when the sun rises, you, you know it, so you can turn your, turn your lights off. Okay, um, I, I talked about the, the necessity of doing a uh, nitrogen purge and pre-breathing oxygen to get the nitrogen out of your blood. This turns to, out to be a, an interesting systems problem because it doesn't just affect the suit, it affects uh, the spacecraft. Um, those of you who were here at the beginning saw I was blowing up a balloon which unfortunately popped. 
uh, it was only to make the point that uh, you can look at a spacesuit, you know, the arms and legs, cylindrical. It's it's like one of those balloons, and you know when you when you try to bend the balloon, uh, it doesn't like to stay bent because you're compressing the gas and you're you're doing elastic work on the material of the balloon, uh, and it wants to snap back. And spacesuits basically work the same way. The old-fashioned uh, pressure suits that that test pilots used to wear, which were the genesis of the original Mercury suits, um, they basically stiffen you. And in fact, the launch entry suits that we use on the shuttle are not designed for joint mobility. They, they just pressurize. And you know, when we we do a pressure check before the um, before the mission, when we're getting suited up, and and they they blow it up, and you just go like that, and it's you know you you can move a little bit, and you know enough so that if you're sitting in your seat with a seat belt holding you in form, so that your waist is belt is bent, uh, you know you can move your arms enough to get to the controls. But I certainly wouldn't want to try to go out and do any useful work in that. So it's really been an extraordinary uh, design process that people have uh, been able to develop spacesuits with articulating joints that allow us I mean it's certainly not not like walking around and doing things in in your just with your body but it's a, it's amazing how flexible uh, spacesuits are and and it's a continual challenge to develop particularly for the gloves uh, uh, and and when we get back to the moon to have legs that you can actually walk in so that you don't have to hop around all the time although there are times when that's good too but in any case the, the stiffness of a suit, uh, because it, it turns out that um, most of the stiffness comes from compressing the gas. So you want to try, first of all, to, to build a, uh, articulated joints that, that don't change their volume. And, and actually, people have designed metallic suits that look like you know Robbie the Robot, so that they, they truly are zero delta volume suits. Problem is, they're very heavy, and there are other problems problems with metallic suits. I, I don't have time to go into that. Um, you're, given that you're going to have some volume change, the amount of work that you do is uh, thermodynamically uh, pressure times volume. So you're going to have a delta V, you want to reduce the pressure. So the, the lower your suit pressure, the, um, uh, the easier it is, is to bend. So basically, you don't want to fill your suit with any gas that you don't really need. We certainly don't need nitrogen to stay alive, not on, not on a short-term basis. So we fill the suit with uh, oxygen, uh, and we run it at about 4.3 psi for the shuttle. Um, this is just historically uh, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. Um, the suit pressure was a little bit lower. Um, doctors felt after after doing calculations of the actual, what you're really interested in is in the partial pressure of oxygen in your blood. And they wanted a little bit more margin since the shuttle was supposed to be operational this and operational that. They wanted a little bit more margin um, and so we, we bumped up the, the suit pressure a little bit. Um, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo cabin was 100% oxygen at the same pressure um, so that you didn't have to worry about pre-breathing. Uh, in Skylab, uh, it was not pure oxygen, but it was a high enough oxygen that, again, they didn't have to worry about pre-breathe. It hasn't been until we went to the shuttle, which typically the shuttle is at, at um, uh, 14 7 or you know 100 kilopascals uh, normal atmospheric pressure and uh, if we know we're going to be doing a lot of EVAs we and I'll talk about this later what we do is we drop the overall cabin pressure but we keep the partial pressure of oxygen the same so you end up bumping up the oxygen concentration we don't do that with the ISS. Um, decision was made by the life scientists that since they wanted to study biology on the space station and all of our database is at one atmosphere, that if they took the space station down to 10.2 PSI, basically it would invalidate 
all of their life science research. Um, so the station was only designed for one atmosphere. The operational people, you know, when, when they started to talk about how much EVA was going to be involved in building and maintaining the space station, you know, the astronauts said, this is crazy, you know, we're, and, and you'll, see the, you'll see the impact of, of, of this uh, later. Um, this is just looking in the future. These are decisions that are going to be have to have to be made for future space systems, of, and uh, and they are uh, looking at at a lower working pressure, and and, you, and you'll see why as I go through the this uh, presentation. Um, I think I'm not going to go through through those charts, but um, again, this is a this is a system, so you're affecting uh, a great many different things. Um, Let's see, where is the, which is the laser here? Laser. There we go. Okay. Um, so, you know, th this is uh, one of the interesting things uh, here with, with uh, EVA, just like in any ECLS uh, system, is that, that the human body becomes one of your subsystems that you have, to, uh, you have to take care of. And in many cases, we don't have a whole lot of design flexibility with our bodies because they come pre-designed. Okay, so, um, so we have to deal with that. Uh, so we've got all, all of the physio physiology, the, the bends, uh, materials. I talked about flammability in a pure oxygen environment. Uh, I talked about the constraints of uh, microgravity and partial gravity physiology studies in the ISS. Of course, NASA has decided that we don't decided that we don't need to do that anymore. So, but that's the that station was, and and I guess our our international partners are still going to want to do this. And in any case, the station is designed. It, the cooling, you know, we we talked about I think in in the Eclis section uh, lecture the fact that if you if you drop your cabin pressure, now you've got to pump. More air for all the air-cooled things, and if if you if you really want to design for a variable cabin pressure, then you're going to have to uh, spend a uh, th that flows over into the cooling requirements, more water cooling, uh, different fan requirements, and so on. Uh, and and it goes on. Um, you know, if you're going to do uh, multiple EVAs, uh, you know the amount of what you're really interested when you're when you're looking at efficiency is uh, we, we call it uh, EVA work efficiency index it's the total amount of time involved in preparing for and carrying out an EVA the ratio of that to the actual useful working time you get outside and the more time you have to spend breathing pure oxygen to de denitrogenate your blood that's taking away from your overall work efficiency when we do tests on the ground and we start out at, f at normal sea level pressure and we want to go down to 4.3 psi pure oxygen we actually have to do a four hour nitrogen purge so we have to just sit in the suit or stand in the suit for four hours this is in the EVA test chambers before we actually can go down to pressure if you want to get an eight hour Workday of EVA, that's just unacceptable. And that's why they made the decision to take to lower the shuttle's cabin pressure, and then you only have to do about a 40 minute EVA. And I have some of the specific numbers on that later. Um, so, as I say, just, just the review here is that we, we do have this capability on the shuttle, we don't have it on the station. Um, they have figured out a few ways to make the denitrogenation process a little bit more efficient than the station, but it's still a big overhead hit. Um, and we're very concerned for the future because, you know, EVA is not just an afterthought when you're going to be exploring on the moon or Mars. You're going there basically to do EVA. You know, otherwise, why bother? So, so we've got to deal with this. Okay, here's the basic physiology that we're dealing with. Um, oxygen percentage on the, uh, on the abscissa, total pressure on the ordinate, and you know all, all different units, millimeters of, of mercury, uh, PSI, and I think I have an, uh, now people use kilopascals, which I 
don't really relate to, but I know about 100 kilopascals is about one atmosphere, so luckily that makes it easy. So, you know, normally uh, we're at, at one atmosphere, 20% uh, or 21% oxygen, we're up, up here, and this is the normal sea level equi equivalent. So, you know, you, you start dropping the pressure and you have to increase the percentage of oxygen. Okay? Um, there is a maximum level of, of breathing oxygen at pressure, uh, oxygen toxicity, because oxygen is almost totally absorbed through your alveoli. And if you have, you know, normally our alveoli stay inflated because we have 80% nitrogen, which, which is only very reluctantly absorbed. I mean, it, it does get through, that's how it gets into our blood and so on, but, but it's a much slower transport. But oxygen gets right through. And if, if you breathe pure oxygen for a long time, your alveoli, it hurt, it, you know, you can really hurt your lungs and it, it, it can be lethal. At, at a certain point. We actually don't have any good physiological data. We, we were, I was down in Houston last week at a big EVA conference. That's, that's why we didn't have class on Tuesday. And they were talking about, you know, what about long-term planetary EVAs, even at 4 PSI, pure oxygen? Is that going to be harmful to health? We, we honestly don't know. And that, that's, a, that's an active area which, which needs research. Um, on the other side, of course, you get into hypoxia, which you've all heard of. You know, you get it when you go up on Mount Everest and, and so on. So, uh, so you, you've got a boundary that you have to work in. Um, now, this is sort of where things uh, have fallen. The blue line is the hypoxic boundary. Uh, green line is normal oxygen. Uh, when we were using pure oxygen spacecraft environments, we were we were well above that, and you'd like to stay as close as possible. With shuttle EVA, we moved a little bit uh, closer to hypoxic, but we're still in a physiologically perfectly uh, perfectly reasonable uh, environment. Um, decompression sickness. Just a quick review. Any scuba divers here? Okay, so you're you're all familiar with this. There's there's various levels of uh, decompression sickness. Um, you know, anywhere from just a mild tingling of the skin to joint pain to uh, to phase three DCS, where you get uh, central nervous system uh, impairment, which can actually cause death. So you don't want to mess around with it. Um, People refer to this famous R value. You, you run into this all the time. What, you, what you're really interested in is what is the ratio between the actual partial pressure of nitrogen in your blood compared to your suit pressure. Um, and this over here shows this is that R value. If, if, you're, if you're down at one, the nitrogen isn't going to bubble out at all, so, so you have no incidence of, of bends. Um, what's it? Uh, VGE, venous gas emboli. Okay, so, and then as the R value increases, uh, the, the dotted line, gas emboli, that just means you have bubbles forming. Um, DCS means actual symptoms of bends, and then grade 3 DCS, which is very serious indeed. The way they make these measurements, they, they have these large physiological studies where they actually get people to volunteer to go through these pump down protocols and then they they actually put sensitive microphones and ultrasound things to that can actually hear the bubbles as they move around your your veins I've never been able to figure out why anybody would volunteer for these experiments I take my hat off to them um, they because you know the only way you build up these uh, this data is that you know some people actually did get Get, they do get the bends from these experiments. And of course, they have hyperbaric chambers, uh, which as soon as there's any symptoms, they put them right into the chamber and pump them to pressure and, and it goes away. And I don't think that they've lost any volunteers. <laughs> like I say, that's not, not something I'm going to volunteer for. Um, 
other factors, and, and this, this is something that, that uh, becomes important. It turns out that the amount of time you spend at reduced pressure is, is important. Also, exercise. It turns out that the more you exercise, you know, maybe it makes sense, you're moving your joints around, but the bubbles come out. So actually what they've started to do on the space station, since we can't go to a reduced cabin, that while they're breathing oxygen for the first hour or so, they do very exhaustive exercise, both upper and lower body on an exercise bike with, with uh, arm exercise as well. So try to get drive away as much of the oxygen early on in the decompression, uh, in, in, in the preparation uh, as you can. Okay, so where does that, that put us? Um, you know, as I said, the more nitrogen you have in your blood to start out with, the longer a pre-breathe you're going to have to do before uh, before you can go out. So here are th these are the uh, normoxic and hypoxic lines which I showed you before and then these are the contours of the amount of time you have to pre-breathe. So okay remember I, I told you if you're at one atmosphere 20 percent oxygen your pre-breathe time is 240 minutes, four hours. This is to get yourself down to an R value of 1.65. So this is not 100% safe because, you know, remember, uh, yeah, at uh, 1.65, which is where these data is, you know, there still is a, you know, 25% incidence of DCS. Now, the interesting thing, these are the, the, the statistics that come from the laboratory trials. We've never had a reported case of, of bends during EVAs, and, and people aren't quite sure why. Uh, some people suspect that maybe even if an astronaut is getting joint pain, they're not going to report it because you don't, you know, maybe that would prevent you from doing another EVA. It also could be, I mean, there's enough other pains that you undergo in just using a spacesuit that maybe you don't even notice it. You know, you feel a problem in your joints or your fingers and you say, oh, damn it, my gloves don't fit right or, you know, something like that. So, uh, but it also, and, and I have another slide mentioning this later, there is, there is some suspicion that weightlessness may have an impact, which means that the Ben's susceptibility on the moon or on Mars may actually be greater than it is in weightlessness. We, we just don't know. Um, so, okay, here's where we've gotten to on the shuttle EVA. Uh, again, where this, is, this is no pre-breathe. This is one hour pre-breathe. So we're at about 40 minutes on the shuttle. And that, that's where we are. Uh, now, this is a design problem. What are we going to, how are we going to design the CEV? How are we going to design the equipment, the habitats that we're going to use on the Moon and Mars? So um, now we're talking about surface exploration. And, and as I said, um, there's a lot of, of uncertainty uh, about the effect of, of gravity, but we suspect that it may be more bends inducing than weightlessness. And so what they're doing for safety uh, and, and conservatism is instead of using the R value of 1.65, which we use on the shuttle, they're taking it down to about 1.3, 1.4, okay? Um, now what does that do? Here's 1.4, 1.3. Where does that put the shuttle EVA? We now would have to get down to that R value. We've got a, a two hour pre-breathe. To get down to 1.3, we've got a two and a half hour pre-breathe. So now, you know, we're, and this is, this is with the, the normal spacesuit at 4.3 PSI. The, you know, we're hitting an, an operational problem. You want to go out on your geology traverse on the moon, you got to depressurize denitrogenate for two, two and a half hours? I don't think so. But what are we going to do? Well, if you increase the suit pressure, now the R value uh, at a given level of nitrogen, the R value goes down. And so, 
uh, at 6 psi, uh, even for an R of 1.3, you're, you're in the zero pre-breathe range, which would be great. So people have suggested, well, maybe we should build a variable pressure suit so that you could go out at 6 psi, sort of get things set up, and, and then you know all that time counts towards your denitrogenation. So maybe then after two hours into your EVA, now you can drop your pressure, and now if you have any, any things where you need more dexterity, you'll be okay. But um, the pressure control system in a, in a spacesuit is a very complex uh, undertaking. The Russians do have a, a dual pressure suit. They, they never use the lower pressure, to, to my knowledge. Um, and it's, it's a big hit to try to design this into the suit. And of course, to design a suit to operate at a higher pressure, the Russians work at about 5 psi, but it means your suit is less flexible, heavier, and it's just going the opposite direction from the desire to accomplish useful work, which is why you're putting on the spacesuit in the first place. So this is what we're working against. Um, again, we've got a systems problem. It's not just the pressure, it's the oxygen. Um, in Skylab, in Apollo, because you were working in a pure oxygen environment, now, of course, now we're talking about what, it, what is the pressure going to be in a cabin, right? So you want to keep the cabin at a high ox higher oxygen environment. You've, your material selection is highly limited. So, as it says, they, they tended to use a lot of metallic materials. Well, what do we know about metals, particularly aluminum? Uh, well, first of all, aluminum will burn, uh, but at 100% oxygen, but okay, your cabin, even if it's not 100% oxygen, you're going to have a lot of metallic material. Well, metal, is, when you're dealing with radiation, you, you hit metal, uh, aluminum or, or higher, even higher Z, higher atomic number metals with uh, primary cosmic rays, and you get spallation produce a lot of secondary particles and you end up with actually more radiation than you would have gotten if you had just gotten hit by the incident cosmic ray. You, what you really prefer is to have a low atomic number. Hydrogen is best. Water, you know, hydrogen and oxygen and so forth. So, uh, you know, if you're forced to increase the metallic content of your spacecraft because of the oxygen flammability problems, now you're you're going in the wrong direction for radiation protection, which becomes an issue when you're dealing with long duration stays on the moon, interplanetary transport, and, and so on. So it's all interrelated. You can't change one thing without, without changing uh, the other. Uh, flammability, well, we've been talking about that. I won't stay on that. But, but again, it, it, is, uh, it, it is very dependent on, on oxygen. It re oxygen restricts the use of non-metallic materials, but non-metallic materials are what we would like to use from a radiation point of view. You'd like to have a lot of hydrocarbons, you know, polyethylene, plastic in your spacecraft, because they absorb cosmic rays. Doesn't work. But in any case, uh, there, it's pretty well agreed that we, we never want to go above 30% oxygen. It just becomes too restrictive on the types of materials we can use. So that's going to be a design constraint. Remember, we're, we're aiming towards a systems level design of our long duration space habitats which are EVA compatible. So 30% oxygen. All right, so now we're, we're back to this. Now we can draw a red line, and, and we've got to stay on the left of that line. We've got to stay above the blue hypoxic line. Now also, remember that we've got these pre-breathe lines. So let's say that we're going to limit pre-breathe to, to no more than one hour. Well, we're, we're cutting down on our design space here. You know, we've got the oxygen flammability, which is cutting off to the right. We've got the hypoxic limit, which is cutting off in this direction. And we've got the pre-breathe limit, which is cutting off there. And we're, we're kind of in a, I won't call it a box, it's a, it's a rather small triangle. Um, and um, now, if we go to a six psi spacesuit, as I said, we we open up the design space a lot, but at a price. 
of flexibility, maneuverability, and the ability to do the things that we want to do in the first place. So, you know, where are we going to go with this? Uh, as I say, it's it's a very it's an active area of research. Uh, you know, I can't tell you what the answer is going to be, um, but uh, it. It looks like they're they're going to uh, probably be going for eight to nine psi with a oxygen concentration approaching thirty percent, and that the CEV from from what I've been told is most likely going to be designed with a variable pressure capability because it also has to be able to dock with the space station, which means it has to be able to take one atmosphere, and also because the CEV by itself is not going to have an airlock, you're going to have to be able, if you'd have to do an emergency EVA out of the CEV for whatever reason, um, you're going to have to depressurize like we did back in the Gemini and Mercury, well, the Gemini days, uh, or Apollo. Um, and, um, and of course, that is going to affect the design of all the other systems on the CEV because they'll have to be able to operate from a vacuum all the way up to a, a, a one, one atmosphere. Um, so just uh, in the end, I, I hope what you've gotten out of this is, again, we're trying to look at things from a systems engineering point of view, and this is one big system where EVA cannot be considered just on its own because it, it affects, you know, I, I gave an example of how it affects the RCS system with, with Hubble. You know, here it affects the environmental control, life support, uh, flammability, radiation protection. It, it's all, uh, it's all uh, linked together. So yeah, this is this was the recommendation that, that we came out with was uh, slightly below nine psi, at pushing thirty percent. But as I said, there's a lot of research that has to be done to understand the uh, the way bends uh, behave at partial gravity. Um, how we're going to do that, I have no idea. Um, but. Um, as I said, for the International Space Station, we have to be able to go up to regular atmosphere. Um, and I think, yes, uh, that, that's what we can, this, this was, a, a, we, we were making this presentation as part of the study we were doing last year on, on CEV, but I, it was so relevant to what we did here that I didn't see any point in modifying it for this class. But uh, you know, we had to make these decisions on the shuttle based on similar uh, calculations, looking at the design space. The difference was with the shuttle, we were using an R value of 1.6, 1.7, and so we we were able to get down to a 40-minute pre-breathe. Um, what we do with the shuttle is about the day before you're going to do your first EVA, you actually drop the cabin pressure. Uh, there is no, and, and I think um, when we had the lecture on environmental control, you remember we had a, there's a cabin pressure controller at 14.7 and a pressure controller at 8 psi, but at, when they designed the shuttle, nobody was thinking about EVA or about this pre-breathe time, and so there is no 10.2 controller, so we have to do that manually. You know, you drop it and then you, you add a little bit of nitrogen or a little bit of oxygen, depending depending on what the instrumentation tells you you need. And then there's a periodic maintenance which you have to perform in order to, to keep the, uh, the proper gas concentrations. Um, and then when, you, when it comes time, and then, and then we leave it down there for the duration of all the EVAs. And then when the last EVA is finished, then you turn the 14.7 controller back on. Now, of course, since you have the proper um, oxygen partial pressure, most of the gas that comes into the cabin is nitrogen. And it actually, I think we may have mentioned this before, it comes in in the bathroom. And so for the time when you're repressurizing the cabin, bathroom is off limits. Uh, and I think that's that's basically it. Um, and the timing has been pretty good. Questions, comments? Yeah. Um, is, is, is anybody looking at using a fully one atmospheric spacesuit? I know it would be basically um, three times. 
actually, it turns out there's there's a principle called Haldane's principle that says that if you if you don't change your um, uh, and, and let me actually uh, in in the other presentation I I had um, oh, where is it now yeah let me let me get this up because I have some pictures of, of what we were doing. Um, if, if you change by less than a factor of two, um, you, you don't get the bends. This is an empirical finding. And so the idea was if, if you could have a suit that worked at about 8 PSI, you, you would have a zero pre-breathe suit. And I participated in a bunch of tests. And let me, uh, there's some other robotic things. Yeah, um, this was a, a the hard suit designed by Ames. It's a it's a you can because uh, because it's a constant volume suit. It's not sensitive to the pressure the way that a uh, an, a soft suit is. And uh, we, and we did a lot of tests actually. To uh, we 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 always came unstuck on on the gloves. Nobody nobody's been able to design an eight psi glove. That um, that really gives you sufficient mobility, and uh, I mean it's a dream. People would love to be able to do it if we could figure it out. That would solve all these problems. Although, you know, if you're going to Mars, maybe maybe you don't want full pressure because you know you're you're if, if you have one atmosphere compared to eight or nine psi, your structure has to be that much thicker and heavier. They went through some of those calculations. This is now, on the other hand, with the space station, and they figured that for all the meteorite shielding and everything they had to put on the outside of the space station, that actually the change in thickness that would be involved in changing the pressure from one atmosphere to another really wouldn't make that much of a difference. So, you know, all of these things again, they're they're interrelated. But uh, but it, it, it's a good point. Yeah, I mean that, that's why I showed those designs for six PSI because people are still thinking, you know, suppose we could design a spacesuit to work at a higher pressure, but right now we don't know how to do that. I hope everybody has a very happy Thanksgiving. We will see you next, a week from today. Uh, and uh, if there's any questions again about uh, either your oral presentations or the written presentations, um, I'll be here today and then I'm gone for the rest of the week. Um, but I will be looking at emails so you can send me emails and we can discuss things. Okay.